Welcome to Crema Media's Resources Watch, a weekly video roundup of the events and people making and shaping the news in the mining industry. This week, diamond giant De Beers opens the diamond route in South Africa. Gold producer Great Basin Gold eyes the mid-tier horizon. And Goldfields discusses the latest issues concerning its mines. Christy van der Maver visits the Kimberley leg of the De Beers diamond route. When you deal with a product which is so vitally emotional, when it is a product given to people for special occasions, to mark special occasions, that you have to, in the producing of that and in the managing of the assets you have, as we say in De Beers, live up to diamonds. And that requires you to behave in a proper and appropriate way. And we were lucky too in the diamond business and that was when you found a diamond mine, round that mine you generally secured a whole number of other claims because there was quite often alluvial outflows from the kimberlytic pipes and it was to protect those sort of things that De Beers acquired land holdings and quickly started looking after those land holdings knowing that it was going to have to do that for future generations. That the Oppenheimer properties and the De Beers properties should be joined together in a diamond route and live up to diamonds. The nine sites making up the diamond routes are the Namaqualand Diamond Coast near Clansia, the Kimberley Big Hole, the Benfantine, Royport and Dronfield Nature Reserves all surrounding Kimberley, the Twalu Kalahari Game Reserve near Uppington, the Brenthurst Gardens in Johannesburg, Isamvelo Nature Reserve outside Pretoria, and the Venetia Limpopo Nature Reserve near Messina. We value uh, the environment and value cons conservation and value our connection with communities and, uh, and the development of the communities around us. When you receive this diamond, it's not only the diamond, it's not only the love, it's also an appreciation of the earth and the conservation and the, where this diamond came from and what it symbolizes in a very real way. Great Basin Gold hopes to ramp up its Burnstone project into full production by June. Great Basin Gold reports that the Burnstone project will achieve first tonnage by June this year. CEO Fadi Dippenar reports on the current progress at the mine. Well, let's start with the decline. I mean, we've made progress to the extent that we're just over 230 meters from holing with the actual vertical shaft. And then we've also started establishing slopes underground. And, uh, you know, in general, all that happens is the more ends you open up, of course, the more production points. And, and that's part of the ramp up of the production. Secondly, if we go to the vertical shaft, I mean, that's uh, doing extremely well. We're down at 450 meters below surface. We're down at uh, 41 level as well. We've got 35 meters of shaft sinking to complete the actual shaft. Uh, with the lateral development on 41 level and the 35 meters, we expect to com have completed that by March of this year, which means equipping of the actual shaft starts. He adds that the Burnstone project has a significant cost advantage over other deeper level gold mines. Well, costs should be low at Burnstone, there's no doubt. If you consider that the mine, the shaft being 485 meters deep, we've started mining at just over 300 meters below surface. We don't require the type of infrastructure that would go with a mine of two, three, four, even four kilometers deep below surface. So from a, let's just call it a, a consumable perspective, in terms of power, we should not consume as much power as the deep level mines uh, support uh, underground, water, electricity, in every measure. And of course safety, let's not forget safety at the end of the day because it is about mining safely as well. So we've, uh, I've no doubt that uh, Bernstein will probably be the uh, cheapest cash cost per ounce produce in South Africa when it's fully operational. Goldfields discusses mine nationalization, government's mine stoppage protocol, negotiating a six-day mining calendar and cutting its electricity consumption by another 50 megawatts. We've seen what nationalization has done in other parts of Africa. It destroyed the coal belt, 
you know, copper belts never been the same, you know, even after you, uh, you privatized them again. Now, coming back to nationalization, you know, it's this week it's on, next week it's off, then it's on. Um, I've spoken to the president directly on this. Um, I don't believe it's an issue. Um, I have spoken to the mining minister. Uh, they assured me it's not going to happen. I've spoken to the department. You know, so is it going to happen? Is it likely to generate value for the country? It won't. I think it's a lot of hot air. Uh, I don't think we should get too worked up about it. And what we need to do is rather focus on delivering. The safety stoppages we're having are quite severe. And um, when we get a stoppage where the whole mine is shut for days on end, you know, you don't just lose the days that the mine is shut, it's the build up again. And the mines just don't react well to stop, start, approach. And there's also a safety issue. We believe right now that the actions being taken can only be classed as punitive given that there's no sense of proportionality that when you have an accident <clears throat> at one shaft, another shaft five, six, seven, ten kilometers away also gets stopped. We've entered into discussions with the union leadership to go into a six-day working week. I've mandated the team now, in fact instructed the team, to find another 50 megawatts. We dropped 50 megawatts between 2008 and um, the end of last year. If every single company decided to take 10% out of their bill would make a difference. It's just not affordable for us to go away and build new capacity. You know, so we are stuck. We are stuck with the grid. A lot of people have said uh, bringing in IPPs is the answer. Um, it's not going to be the solution in the short run. Yeah. Because for IPPs to come in, um, by and large they're going to be offshore entities. Uh, they are going to require a short payback on their capital. They are going to require a risk-adjusted rate of return that reflects the risk profile of the country. They're going to require purchase power agreements that are underwritten by government. Regrettably, I don't think any IPP is going to rely on a purchasing power agreement that is underwritten purely by ESCO. We're going to have to hunker down and we're all going to have to save some power and try and make sure that we can have a long-term solution for the power issue. For mining news as it breaks, stay logged on to miningweekly.com and register for our free daily newsletter.